Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, you're joining us for part two, The Whalers of Barrow, Alaska. Boy, did we get telephone calls from part one. You might have even been able to watch the one hour special. You can order this tape, by the way. Give us a call here at Heartbeat Alaska or email me at Green at AK. Net. Today we learn more about the tradition of whaling in Barrow, Alaska. Top of the world. I'll be back with Barrow Whalers right after this. Heartbeat Alaska is pleased to announce a brand new official hotel. We're brought to you now by Millennium Alaskan Hotel, the official hotel of Heartbeat Alaska. And... Heartbeat Alaska is also brought to you by Frontier Flying Service. Thank you, Frontier, for getting Heartbeat Alaska airborne. Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Brown's Electric Lighting Gallery. Thank you, Brown's Electric, for your generous support of Heartbeat Alaska. Heartbeat Alaska is made possible by Kupik Carlisle Transportation, your full-service transportation and logistics company. Welcome back. Well, let's take off to Barrow, Alaska once again. What an adventure this is with the ever-changing ice flows. The Inupiaq people of the North have survived for so long, even in this modern age, by helping each other, by working together. You see it in everyday life around these parts. Family members and friends helping out when an extra hand is needed. You especially see it when it comes to whaling season. Pulling a whale up onto the ice is no easy chore. It takes a great deal of manpower and tremendous support from the shore. A large amount of responsibility belongs to the wife of the captain, the captain's family, and the families of crew members as well. When news of a crew getting a whale hits town, the captain's wife gets busy. Preparation for Nrikai and the Apawauti have begun. We're all already thinking, okay, you need to have some uh, flour for the donuts. You need to think about the crew that's bringing it in. They're going to be hungry. So main thing is you make some soup something they can eat um, when they get to shore or down there. And you also think about um, those who help towing and those who help cut up. Up here, I worry about, um, you know, fruit that's going to be served as well as um, getting the pots and the stoves ready um, <clears throat> and how well you get this your house ready, you know, you could cover it up if you want because there'll be a lot of traffic in and out. And generally, you can cover it with cardboard for the next few days. Back in the ice, the people are slowly but surely making progress with the whale. More of the community has come out to help get this huge bowhead up on the ice. But now, concerns are focused on the west wind. When the wind changes, west wind, that's when the ice starts coming in. Right now, we want, we want to try and get east winds or let the wind pick up stronger so it can, so it can blow, out, blow away. <laughs> oh 
The huge ice flow that has been drifting by them for the past few hours has changed its course and is now quickly making its way towards the whalers. I mean, just one big floating ice. It looks like about eight, ten miles long, about five miles wide. I did one big massive ice flow. Many of the volunteers start packing things up and moving them back onto stronger ice. These types of situations are common when you live in the far north, situations that require the wisdom of the elders. They're the ones who have done this for decades and have seen more in their lifetime than we could possibly imagine. The elders are books of knowledge that are only open to their people. They have seen the ice threaten their catches before. They have seen the ice come in and take the whale back into the sea with it. With the knowledge and experiences of these elders, the whale may be saved. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now to keep that ice, even though it looks threatening, to keep its distance until we are done. Desperate attempts are made to get this whale up on the ice before the swiftly approaching ice pack takes the whale under. We don't see it here, but the moment occurred when the decision was made to cut the whale in half. After securing the majority of the whale that was still in the water to the ice they were on, they quickly cut the whale in half. While we were butchering the whale, um, I come in, man, he was, he was calm, very calm out there. When the captain tell, tell us that we had to cut it in half, so we had no choice. We left a part of the head, so if the weather shifted and if there's an opening, they're going to go back down there and do the same thing again, cut it all up. We gotta make sure everybody gets the whole share. Part of life growing up here. A lot of times we lose the whole wheel. Yeah. Ah! On, I'm huh? glad they were alert. By cutting the wheel in half, these whalers were able to assure that at least part of this bowhead would be harvested. They would now have to wait for the lead to open and the ice pack to move away from the whale before any more attempts could be made to get the whale up on the ice. With most of the whale still in the sea, the cutters quickly get back to the butchering. When they are through with this whale, the only thing that will be left is the head bone and the vertebrae. They will use almost every part of the whale. The stuff is um, liver membrane from a bowhead whale. In fact, the youngest drum maker in Barrow, 17-year-old Edgar Skin, uses part of the whale to make drums for his dance group, the Barrow Dancers. It's a timeless tradition that Edgar has turned into a hobby. Not only is Edgar following in the steps of his ancestors, but he is also helping to assure that the art of drum making will never perish from his people. It's easy to see that he takes his work seriously, spending the time to do it right. Okay, I'm about to put this string around in this groove, and that the string will be what keeps the cover on and tight. And as I'm pulling it, as I go, just keep making it tighter. It tightens this part so you can get the right sound. It didn't take Edgar long to put the head of the drum on, turning and tightening the head so that it matches the sound of the other drums he has made. 
When he is satisfied with the tension of the drum head, Edgar ties off the sinew and begins trimming the excess membrane so that the drum will look as good as it sounds. It's impressive to witness one of these drums being made, the craftsmanship, patience, and attention to detail. But what's even more impressive is that at one point, an adult or an elder took the time to teach the ways of their people to Edgar so that this knowledge would never get lost in the pages of time. Each week, Heartbeat Alaska brings you great stories from all over the state. And we couldn't do it without the generous support of Frontier Flying Service. Frontier gets our camera crews where they need to go. So whenever you see a Frontier plane, give them a wave. Say hi from Northland. You might just be on Heartbeat Alaska. Frontier Flying Service, covering Alaska for over 50 years. Don Crombie's philosophy is, there's always room for one more. At the dinner table, in the car, in her heart. The Crombies have six children, five of them adopted. Six children now have a mom, a dad, brothers and sisters. The Crombies made room for six. Can you find room in your heart for one? Adopt a kid. Or two. And watch them grow with love. The people of the North are so strong. Inupiaq women, strong and capable and as their men are. And today we take a look at something else that is strong. It takes strength to come together. It takes strength to make this book. This book is a wonderful tool used by the people of Barrow, Alaska to teach their youth the culture, the whaling traditions using the Inupiaq language. Isn't that something, a timeless way to keep their tradition going on forever? The North Slope Borough School District has recognized the need for the youth to understand and learn their language, especially those who partake in the subsistence lifestyle, and have created a book that not only teaches the youth about subsistence terms and local ocean currents, but does it in both the English and Inupiaq languages. It's called Agavik Sirunikun. And the concept was developed by Jenna Hacharik, who is the bilingual coordinator for, for the district. And she came to me wanting the, the students to know wind directions, current directions, um, weather terminology, all in Inupiaq. So, so from her ideas, I then sat down and, and came up with images, and we kind of bounced ideas back and forth off of each other. And what we came up with was Inupiaq names for, for the wind directions and current directions, directional terminology, the parts of the, the harpoon, all in Inupiaq. Um, <clears throat> Terminology for, for the umiak, for the, for the skin boat, and also of the whale distribution in, in the communities, you know, which parts of the whale are distributed to whom. And there's also a section for the student to document um, the lead conditions out on the ice. Um, and this is, this is to, again, bring in their, their writing skills and their, their, critical, their critical thinking skills. There's also a section, a section for the students to, to write down the stories that they're here because when you're out on the ice, you're, you're with more experienced whalers who have just some incredible stories to share. And so this is a way for them to, to use their writing skills and to also, you know, um, record these these stories so they can be remembered and passed on. One particular story that belongs to a whaling captain, Jonathan Aiken Sr., teaches all those who hear it about the power of prayer. It seems that Mr. Aiken and another hunter were out in their umak one season, perched upon a piece of ice hunting walrus. A lone walrus appeared in front of them, lazily floating by, resting. The other hunter raised his gun, but Jonathan, feeling uneasy about this walrus all by itself, 
asked the other hunter not to shoot. By that time, the other man had already pulled the trigger, delivering a fatal shot to the walrus. Before the two men could even get out of their umayak, the piece of ice they were sitting on was surrounded by a herd of angry walrus. As the walrus approached the hunters, threatening their well-being, the men shot the beast until they reached the last of their ammunition. I'm worth around five thoughts left. I can shoot them no more. <laughs> but and we, and I sit on the boat, on top of the boat, from the boat, and I pray, and I pray, I need help, I need help. But in maybe 15, 15 minutes, the kilo haze was coming. One was with a big walrus, big, big kilo whale. He bite it and go, go up. The water, we, I see the big walrus. Yeah. But some of them was little ones, four of them. But uh, the, the, all around us, it's bloody. Front of us, it's bloody. All over. And the, no more, no more walrus. What happened next is nothing less than a miracle testimony to the connections that these Anubiak people have with their surroundings and with their creator. After the killer whales had chased off the walrus and killed many of the others, the whales then surrounded Jonathan's Umiak and guided the two hunters safely away from the ice. And killer, one killer here I was on the front, and I go, and we would, and the two was in the back, and the two was on the side of us. And nobody can touch the thing, nobody can do it, the walrus can do it. So <laughs> and we go up, faster I go, faster and faster. They were still on the front side in the back. The killer whales steer the umiak and the hunters towards an approaching boat. As the boats get closer, the whales veer from their sentry positions and disappear into the Chukchi Sea. As for this whale, well, the people are grateful for what they were allowed to get, but the passing ice flow has decided to stay for a while. And that means that these whalers will have to return when the lead goes out. When the gear has been packed away and the area picked up, the tired people return to the shores of Barrow where the captain begins dividing the meat and muktuk up into portions. Uh, right there, that one right there. As the captain starts to delegate portions, the crew's flag is brought in from the ice and a hauler goes out across the shore. Exhausted and hungry, Captain Henry Kignick is relieved of duty by his wife, Juanita, who has no problem getting these tired workers back into high gear. Right there, right there, those ones right there. He's got the mark right here already, so you guys have to take those ones that way. Hey, giving it out to all the, um, all those guys who've been working out there all night. That's what we do for a living. No, it's a hard work, no matter what we go through. Uh, all we do is just divide it, make sure everybody get all the share. At the end of it all, people's names are called, and they choose which pile of muktuk and meat they want by standing next to it. Good 
As the night winds down, Henry and his family load their catch into the truck and prepare to call it a day. Waiting patiently until the lead goes out and the remaining whale can be harvested. The following morning, crews have headed back out to the whaling site. The ice has shifted, and this small group of whalers is going to try and bring the rest of the whale up on the ice pack. Ready? But as unpredictable as nature is, the west winds kick up and force the ice flow back towards the shore, slowly but surely burying the whale again. Where's the hook? We need a hook. With what little time they had, these people managed to get a great deal of muktuk off the whale before the ice stopped all progress. Since the whale belongs to the captain, he or his wife must be called out to the site so that the muktuk can be divided up between those who harvested the whale today. Maybe go, go get those other tools this way. Yeah, in a, make, make a row like that. Yeah, there you go, like that. Come on, that Two more. Come on, second one more. With such a small group present, the shares will be generous. Oliver! Right here. You're in charge. Right here. How many Arvichs do we have? One, two. Um, let's get the slips, huh? This is all ours, yeah. While the action is settling down on the ice, it's just beginning for Henry Kignick and his family. That's the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what living for Jesus is all about. God is calling us a new generation. There's nothing like being moved by the spirit of God. The love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. That's what I need. I need the love of God. Those of you uh, out there that are watching tonight, it is the word of God is what you need. Wow. What work. This is an eye-opener for my viewers and even for me. The work it takes to butcher a whale. The work it takes to cut it apart and to, to share it with the community. The people of Barrow love to celebrate, but that also takes work as well. Yeah. <laughs> we're gonna be we're gonna be cutting and serving today. Look like we got oh my auntie's coming in. Yay! What we're doing here is we're cooking all the muktuks, making unalik for a serving. We'll be serving the community tonight or when when we're ready. Everybody come and get a good meal for their bellies. It's very delicious. And uh, this is a serving for tonight that we'll be doing. And uh, after we're done with serving with all this, is comes next is the Apuaudi Eskimo picnic, which will be served uh, making up. But here, this is right when they're done with Cutting up the whale, they serve right away when we're ready. And it's gonna be a good meal. Come on, come on. It's been said, it takes a village to raise a child. Truth be known, it takes a village working together to survive in the nation's northernmost community. It's the afternoon of June 2nd, 2003. To the people of the far north, it's another day to hunt. 
another day to feast, another day to carry on the Anupiaq way of life like they did the year before, and the year before that, and the year before that, and the year before that. 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 Thank you, everyone in Barrow, Alaska, for your help on this story. Thank you, Audrey, and the rest of the native village of Barrow for making it possible for us to gather this video and share it with our viewers. What a fabulous program. What a fabulous, beautiful, beautiful group of people in Barrow, Alaska, our good friends and relatives. And thank you so much for joining us once again for Heartbeat Alaska Native News and Native Information. I'm Jeannie Green. God bless you. We'll see you again next week. To purchase a VHS copy of this program, have your credit card number ready and call area code 907-563-7440 or mail $20 check or money order to Jeannie Green Productions, 6216 Old Seward Highway, Anchorage, Alaska 99518. Ask for the program number listed below. I believe the man, the man's name years and years ago was named Igasak, I believe. Anyway, one of the great old-time whalers from a th two, three generations ago. Anyway, they said he said that they were not too many whales were running. It was that time of the year. Anyway, they were out there and had been out there for quite a while. But the crew spotted a whale way, way off to the west. They could just see the sprout, the spout could just barely see the whale. And uh, it takes quite a while for the whales to get there to you. But anyway, that old man went up to the front of the boat and just start sitting there. He just sat there and people kind of forgot what was going on. They'd keep an eye for the whale, but the whales, they couldn't see it. Said that they waited and waited and then all of a sudden, the uh, rest of the crew heard a, an explosion. And when they went to go try to help him, he was already being dragged out on the boat. And what he had done was just waited there. And the whale did come up right in front of him. And he took his time and threw his darting gun, which has the harpoon with the float and the line, and, and that, that guy had uh, given it a hard shot, just, just the way that he knew. And he knew he had enough confidence in his skill to uh, know that if he could just hold on a while longer, that uh, he wouldn't lose that whale. That's how precious the whales were to them. <laughs>